I guess I'll start off with this title, and uh, <laughs> it's actually pretty good. Um, the Truly Unintended Effects of the Fed uh, is what I'm uh, going to talk about today. And uh, Jeff came up with this based on, you know, I told him that I'd done a paper in this area. And uh, this is pretty close. Or Originally when I saw it, I thought this was pretty good, but it occurred to me later, sort of talking with a few people, that um, in order to talk about the truly unintended uh, effects of the Fed, you sort of have to identify what the truly intended effects of the Fed are. And the key word there is truly, okay, and what the effects are and who intended them and so forth. And so that's maybe not such an easy thing to do. Um, so I'll talk about uh, what some people's intentions are, and uh, I'll talk about one specific intention of the Fed, which is... Uh, smoothing interest rates, and there are reasons for doing that, supposedly, that we'll get into. And uh, what I'd like to do is talk about how interest rate smoothing uh, can, it, can have uh, consequential uh, unintended effects. Okay. Uh, first, a little bit of uh, background information, just really quickly. Uh, central banking began in, uh, not the United States, but England in uh, 1694, and uh, actually, the United States was the last major nation to have uh, a, a central banking. Uh, and that, of course, came with the adoption of the Federal Reserve System in very late 1913. Uh, the first paper money in the Western world uh, appeared in the colonies, actually the colony of Massachusetts in 1690, uh, right, actually right before the first central bank appeared in England. And... Uh, Printing was developed in China, so the first paper money in the world uh, appeared in China around the mid-8th century in China. Okay. Okay, so what does the Fed do? Well, one of the things the Fed does is, uh, is it alters the money supply, okay, or alters the amount of credit. And uh, in this book, uh, The Case Against the Fed, Rothbard opens up with a little discussion on the money supply and what the optimal quantity of money is, okay? And I think we're, we're all sort of uh, versed in this area, but let me just read here uh, something on that, uh, just to catch us up if we're not. He says, an increase in the supply of money cannot relieve the natural scarcity of consumer or capital goods, okay? Uh, that's, that stuff's still going to be present. All it does is to make the dollar or the franc or whatever money we're using cheaper, that is, it lowers uh, whatever money we're using's purchasing power in terms of all other goods or services. Uh, so once a good has been established as a money on the market, then uh, it exerts full power as a mechanism of, an, of exchange or an instrument of calculation. So all that an increase in the quantity of dollars or whatever money we're using does is dilute the effectiveness of the, or the purchasing power of each dollar. So the great truth of monetary theory emerges, and that is that once a uh, commodity is in sufficient supply to be adopted as a money, no further increase in the supply of money is needed. Okay? Any quantity of money in society is optimal. Okay? Once a money is established, an increase in its supply confers no social benefit. Okay? Yet we have a Federal Reserve System, and have had it for, for quite some time, that changes the supply of money and uh, you know, is sort of hoping that this has some sort of effects, uh, some ends that it tries to achieve by changing the supply of money. And this, this is, has led to debates in different schools of e economics. The neoclassicals say that uh, uh, nominal changes in money supply have little or no effects in real variables. Uh, the Austrians would say that uh, if it's not perfectly anticipated, uh, nominal changes in the money supply can have real effects. Okay. So uh, changing money supply and interest rates can have real effects, and uh, that's sort of the uh, brunt of my of my talk. Okay. So what is the role of the Fed then? What are the truly intended effects of the Fed? Well, that depends on who you ask. Uh, Rothbard would say and does say that the central bank has always had uh, two major roles. Uh, the first of which is to help finance the government's deficit. Okay, and I don't know if it was by coincidence or not, but the Fed sort of popped up right in time to finance the government's uh, uh, war effort in World War I in the United States. The second role of the central bank is to cartelize the private commercial banks in the country. Okay, 
uh, to get them all together. Uh, so as to, to help remove the two great market limits on their expansion of credit or on their propensity to counterfeit. And these are a possible loss of confidence leading to bank runs and the loss of reserves should any one bank expand its own credit. Okay. Now, uh, <coughs> let's talk for a little bit about uh, bank runs. Um, there were, before and after the Fed, there were uh, a great many bank failures due to bank runs in the United States. And one of the uh, rationales that has sort of developed in the literature, one of the reasons for this, is that there are seasonal fluctuations in the demand for credit. Okay? Uh, and this is sort of tied in with a highly agricultural economy. And the, the reason for this, farmers demand credit in seasonal patterns, okay, in high demand at certain times during the year and low demand at other times. And this is based on the, the idea that they need credit to move uh, their crops to market, okay, and to just run their farming operations. And there is, uh, in the uh, literature in this area on, on banking panics and so forth, uh, uh, I think it's Myron finds that there's a positive relationship between the volatility of um, of this demand for credit or the volatility of the interest rates and the number of banking panics. Okay, and the idea is the more seasonal uh, the demand for credit by farmers, this causes introduces seasonality into the interest rates. Okay, and this is putting a lot of pressure on banks. Okay, that are providing sort of small uh, banks that are providing credit for these farmers, and so this this could lead to high volatility, and that demand could lead to bank runs. Okay, and so from there, it seems reasonable that if we can somehow reduce the volatility of the interest rate, and we can reduce the volatility of the demands on banks, and reduce bank runs or banking panics. Okay. And one way to do this to reduce, take seasonality out of the interest rate is to mess with the money supply, okay? And that's what the Fed attempts to do, okay? Now, th this gets complicated pretty quickly because um, there are other things that could be causing these panics, uh, tons of other things. Uh, and one of these, which I'll get to later, is uh, this idea of uh, branch banking, and in the United States, it was prohibited branch banking. So what we have is sort of a lot of smaller independent banks that are providing credit uh, as compared to maybe a system in Canada uh, where uh, branch banking is permitted. And what you end up with, with is a lot of larger, uh, more uh, uh, sort of all-encompassing banks, okay, banks that are providing uh, credit not just in one state. I mean, in Canada, there's not states, but just to make a analogy to the United States, you know, sort of countrywide banks or whatever, larger banks. And it seems to me that larger banks would be a lot, uh, it would be easier for them to deal with um, shocks as far as like in the demand for credit, okay? Um, so anyway, uh, let, let me talk about, uh, for a second here, changing the interest rate with the money supply, Okay. So the Fed comes in in late 1913 and it starts doing this. It starts smoothing interest rates by varying the money supply. And the idea here is an interest rate, it just let's talk in real simple terms here. If you can imagine the uh, supply and demand for money uh, in some market determining the equilibrium quant or quantity and price of money, that price of money or the price of credit is the interest rate. Okay, the supply of money is determined by borrow or uh, yeah, I'm sorry, savers uh, or lenders, and the demand for money is determined by borrowers. Uh, and so the equal, you know, you've got your supply curve and demand curve, and you get an equilibrium price, the interest rate. Well, what happens is uh, when you artificially increase the supply of money, let's say to lower the interest rate, uh, this drives the interest rate down. It shifts the supply curve out artificially, but Artificially lowering the interest rate from its equilibrium level has two effects. First of all, it causes people to want to borrow more, okay, because it's now cheaper to do so. Uh, but on the other hand, it causes people to want to save less because the return to savings has now gone down. And so this is sort of uh, the Austrian theory of the business cycle in a nutshell, uh, sort of a two-minute version. 
uh, it drives a wedge between, it's just a, a price ceiling or driving a price fixing. It drives a wedge between savings and investment. So when you artificially lower the interest rate, it causes people to take on projects, uh, sort of more farther removed projects, because it's now cheaper to do so. Okay, the price of borrowing money has gone down. <clears throat> but it also induces people to save less, so that as these projects are coming into fruition, the money runs out, and there's some sort of mad scramble for uh, credit, and then the thing collapses, and this causes a business cycle. Okay, so... The literature then suggests that, uh, and that they find that indeed, uh, after the Fed comes into existence, uh, yeah, interest rates do become smoother, okay, and this is supposedly a good thing, and this is done by uh, changes in the money supply, okay, and the cause and effect there is fine, and they find that the uh, money supply becomes more seasonal, okay, to, to smooth the interest rates. But the thing is, you have to understand that, that that doesn't just take place inside a sealed Coke can and uh, everything else stays put, okay? Changes in the money supply are having these real effects, or the Austrian uh, theory of the business cycle would say, that changes in the money supply are having other real effects in the economy, okay? So if if it's okay to look at money supply and interest rates and we've taken the seasonality out of interest rates, put it into the money supply... And some people say that that has reduced the frequency of uh, banking panics. I didn't mean to slap Rothbard there. <laughs> uh, some other people say that that has reduced the frequency of, uh, of uh, bank panics. But what has it done to other variables in the economy? Okay. And so I wrote this paper, uh, I guess almost two years ago, studying that. Okay. We, took, we looked at pre- and post-Fed data uh, on a number of other variables, such as uh, bank clearings in and outside of New York, uh, business failures in terms of liabilities, business failures in terms of the number of business failures, uh, interest rates, uh, factory employment indexes, uh, money supply variables, new business incorporations, uh, log of industrial production, bank failures, unfortunately we... Uh, I don't know if Dr. Wells has found the, the data yet, but we didn't have pre-fed data on bank failures, which would have been good. Uh, other price indexes, and uh, I, I mentioned interest rates. So other variables, what's going on with them when we're taking seasonality out of interest rates and putting it into the money supply? Okay, Are they becoming more seasonal? Okay, This would be the unintended effects of the Fed. Okay, And it turns out uh, that they are. Okay, it turns out that these other variables are becoming more seasonal. Okay, you're introducing volatility into variables that sort of fell outside of the realm of these two little things that you were concentrating on. Okay, and uh, that then sort of the theory that uh, smoothing interest rates is decreasing banking panics sort of falls by the wayside. Okay, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me anymore that smoothing interest rates is decreasing these bank panics. I mean, what else is this doing? Well, it's introducing seasonality, which can cause uh, other real effects in the economy. Okay, so these are the unintended uh, effects of the Fed. So let me get back for a second and uh, uh, talk about banking panics in the United States. Um, these, these people in the literature suggest that banking panics in the United States are helped by after the Fed comes in. Okay, the, one of the roles of the Fed is to act as a lender of last resort to banks. So if banks go uh, experience troubles or whatever, uh, the uh, Fed can loan them the money and everything's fine. And this will have some uh, effect on people's expectations. Okay, people will be more confident in banks if they're backed by the Fed and so on and so forth. Um, so that's all. That's that's fine, and that's uh, one interpretation. But it, uh, another possible explanation for uh, more, if you compare, th there's some literature by, uh, or specifically a paper by Bordo, Rockoff, and Reddish, and what they do is they compare the United States banking system to the banking system in Canada. 
and uh, they try to identify, they seem to think that there is a trade-off between these, if you look at any given country, between the stability of a country, or the stability of a country's banking system uh, and the efficiency of a country's banking system. Okay, so let me uh, explain that for a second. Um, in Canada, branch banking is allowed. Okay, and I've mentioned this uh, a few minutes ago. And so what you, you tend to get are larger banks that are sort of more widely dispersed in terms of the areas that they're operating. Uh, branches for branching all over the place. Whereas with non, when that's prohibited, which it was in the United States, if branch banking is prohibited, you have to, you tend to have a lot of decentralized, uh, smaller local banks. Okay. Um, and so, in the Canadian system, then it would seem would be more stable in terms of their ability to deal with, uh, let's say, volatility in the demand for credit. Okay. And indeed it was. They've had far fewer uh, bank failures. In fact, I think this paper said they've only had one major bank failure uh, in this century. Just one. Okay. As compared to the United States, who's had uh, quite a few. Uh, death a, a lot around this time before the Fed came in. A lot around the Great Depression. Not so many after, there, after that time, but then in the 1980s, uh, we started to see this once again. Okay. So if you... Uh, allow branch banking, you get sort of a larger, uh, more stable system. But then the apparent trade-off of that is that possibly if you've got, uh, let's say, 10 huge banks in your country instead of a 1,000 small banks, the uh, opportunities for collusion between these banks are greater. Okay, it's sort of a, um, uh, an oligopoly of banks in your country. Okay, so there might be an efficiency trade-off. Okay, we've got a better system in that it's more stable. It's more able to deal with uh, volatility and the demand for credit. Uh, but on the other hand, we might be paying, it might be less efficient in terms of sort of the, the banks are charging monopoly rates on uh, uh, borrowing money and lending and so forth, okay, and on all the, the uh, services that they charge for. Okay? So that was sort of the theory up till this time when uh, Bordeaux, Rockoff, and Reddish write this paper and compare the two systems. And what they found was, uh, interestingly, uh, that yes, indeed, the uh, Canadian system, where they allowed branch banking, they found that yes, indeed, it was more stable than the American system. Okay, that was sort of the obvious part. But when they went back and tested efficiency, they found out that they were about both as efficient as each other. Okay, so that seems to suggest then, if you're you know trying to design some uh, banking system for a country, this evidence suggests that a freer uh, in the terms of being allowed to branch and do whatever, a freer system is better. It's going to give you increased stability, but it's not going to cost you efficiency. Okay? So then if uh, stability was what the United States wanted uh, at this time in the early 1900s, uh, their answer was to come in and bring in the Federal Reserve System. Okay, and we're going to get stability by artificially... Uh, adjusting interest rates, we're going to smooth them, and that's going to give us stability. Well, it hasn't. It has not done that. Okay. Uh, you have a Federal Reserve system that's come in. We saw banking panics shortly after the Federal Reserve came in, and a lot of that, and then the Great Depression, and that can, the, the Austrians say, be attributed to large uh, expansionary policy throughout the 20s, which led to a huge collapse in the 30s, okay, this this system came in and people didn't know what the heck was going on. Okay, so, I mean, the more people don't know uh, how, like, expanding the money supply is going to affect interest rates, the more they're going to, going to be fooled by nominal changes. Okay, so this leads to a massive uh, depression in the 30s. And then also, you've got uh, a bank coming in and acting as a lender of last resort to small banks or just banks in general. Okay, if you get into trouble, we'll bail you out. Now, is that a good thing? Well, um, a lot of the problems in the in recent 80s with the uh, savings and loan can be attributed to uh, FDIC insurance, forcing insurance onto companies. Here, you you have to have insurance, uh, and here's what you're going to pay for it. And so, what does that do to the riskiness of the projects that you undertake? Well, obviously, it's going to change that. Okay. If I force you to get insurance, it's going to uh, uh, lead you to undertake more risky projects. And um, uh, so it seems that, you know, we, 
we've got a system here at the beginning of the 1900s and far, you know, far back uh, before that. And uh, we impose constraints on it, so you can't you know, take away some of the system's freedoms in terms of what banks can do, like branching and so forth. And this creates problems. And the other, the way to solve it is to bring in this, you know, make it more bureaucratic, centralize it even more. Okay, more government in terms of the Fed coming in in 1913. Well, if you compare that to Canada, all they had to do, it seems, was free it up. Okay, now this analysis is, is simple, obviously, but uh, that's the conclusion that, that I've come to with this. Uh, Canada, you have increased stability with as you increase freedom, and it's, so you don't get that efficiency cost. And sort of um, an interesting note on, on just bank failures in general and the sort of the lender of last resort role of the Fed, um, do, do you really want an agency coming in, okay, let's say uh, the Fed coming in, and acting as a lender of last resort, a bailout mechanism for banks. Now, I mean, on the face of it, that seems to be a good thing that's going to save people money in the you know, event of catastrophes and this and that. But if you view this as sort of a dynamic, how this is going to change businesses' incentives, I'm not sure that that's such a good thing at all. I mean, do we want, um, do we want some... Uh, how, how is a bank truly different than any other business, I guess, is my question. Uh, don't we want the bad businesses to fail? Isn't that part of the market process? Doesn't that give businesses incentives to uh, uh, take actions that will uh, you know, lead to them not failing, to be better businesses, to produce quality products and services? Okay. You know, if the business is responsible, if the business has to uh, cover all the costs of its actions... Uh, they're probably going to make better decisions uh, as opposed to a situation in which they don't have to cover the cost of their actions. So, you know, I'm, I'm not so sure I uh, agree with the whole lender of last resort uh, purpose of the Fed in the first place. Uh, and that's basically it. Uh, as promised, I've sort of shifted the uh, average back into the where it should be. <laughs> uh, are there any questions? Okay. Well, maybe I missed it, but when they were comparing uh, stability versus efficiency, what was the efficiency? The efficiency. How are they measured or how are they discussing? Uh, they're looking at the, that paper. Okay, efficiency is in terms of there's a loss in efficiency if the uh, <coughs> banks or whatever can uh, oligopolistically get together and charge monopoly prices for their services. Okay, as opposed to a highly competitive banking system, which would be more efficient, just in terms of the way we think of uh, allocative efficiency and productive efficiency mm -hmm. of firms. And so to measure that, they looked at the returns that these banks, they looked at uh, um, uh, financial uh, da data, uh, balance sheet and uh, income statement data for these banks, okay, and looked at what kind of return these banks were making on uh, their activities. And they found then that there, were little, there was little difference between the returns or the efficiency of the banking system in uh, Canada and the United States. Okay, And this also sort of, uh, I think, goes well with what Austrians think about you know, free markets and monopoly and stuff like that. Uh, so long as there's uh, entry as possible, you shouldn't, you know, even if there's two or three or four firms. In this case, I think Canada's got 11 really large banks. And so if there's 11 banks, yes, it's possible that they could um, cartelize or you know, form some oligopoly and uh, rip consumers off. But there's always that incentive to cheat. And there's always entry and so forth. And so you end up not seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, how closely tied were the um, Canadian banks to the Bank of England? Uh, I don't know. I do not know. Well, in what tried. respect? Well, until you know, Canada became you know, a separate country, I would imagine that but since the Bank of England was mm -hmm. controlling you know, the empire and all the banks in the empire. I would have when did Canada become a separate country? I don't know. 1867. Yeah. I don't know when the Bank of Canada was set up. It was yeah. later. What? Yeah, 35. 
It was, I think that was the last Western country that got a central bank, wasn't it? He said major. Yeah, it depends on what you consider major. So there was a period of about 70 years when Canada didn't have a central bank and had branching. That's right. Free banking? And England then did. But apparently they weren't, I mean, they're free in the sense that they weren't tied. I guess that sort of implies that they weren't tied into England's banks. They weren't like member banks of England's central bank. When did Canada break away from the pound toward the dollar? Was that when, or to its own dollar? Was that when it declared its independence? Because if they were using pounds still, then they would be tied to the Bank of England. Well, the Canadian dollar goes way back into the 19th century, but it was on the gold standard. All the gold standard countries were tied to the Bank of England. Yes. And to have allowed national branch banking in the time of the establishment of the Fed would have required the central government overriding all the states. I mean, it's not that national branch banking was illegal. It was just, you know, because of the federal setup. In your view, if that had been, if national branch banking had been enacted in Congress, which I guess it might have had a difficult time getting away with it, but would there have been other negative effects in your view? Of national? Of balance, yeah, from a political standpoint, maybe. Well, are you talking about branch banking with the Fed? If you had national branch banking, would it have required an act of the central government overriding all the state governments? Well, I actually don't know. I don't know. I think, didn't the National Banking Act outlaw branch banking? Yes. Interstate branch banking? Well, what it said was that no branch bank could... Can go beyond state borders. ...contrary to the laws of the state. It's located, even if it were a national bank. Yeah, but then some, but then so the laws on banking varied from state to state, and some, as I understand it, some banks had much more leeway as far as, like, state branching. You know, that varied a great deal from state to state to the extremes. You know, you could branch all over the state in some states, and some other states you couldn't do it at all. And so, I don't know. I don't think that, I think branch banking, allowing it between states, is a good idea for the stability reason. I think that, let's, I mean, some states are more agriculturally intensive than other states. Okay, and so if you, it just seems to me if you've got a bank that can span state borders, or let's say be national, it's just going to be a lot better insulated from state shocks, where shocks are defined as high volatility or some sort of seasonal volatility in the demand for credit. Okay, so, but then again, you've got the problem of different states, you know, where did that bank start, how, you've got 50 or however many states at any given time with different laws on banking, how are these states, how are they going to reconcile or deal with each other in terms of whose, you know, state laws they have to follow or not, which I guess sort of leads to your question, does it require some sort of national laws or lack thereof on banking? I don't know. Yes? When you were saying, when you were talking about interest rate smoothing, you were referring to the agricultural cycle because there was these seasonality swings. The Fed or the Secretary of the Treasury before that would try to smooth the interest rate. And then, I'm not sure if I understood this correctly, were you saying that because of this interest rate smoothing that this caused seasonality in all these, in other industries not related to agriculture? Yes, yes, yes. And that's what the data shows. You take seasonality, you say, you've got sort of natural seasonality in interest rates because of these agricultural cycles, the demand for credit by farmers or whatever. And that's a bad thing because you think that that's causing banking panics. So you say, we want to smooth that out so that there's less stress on these banks. 
uh, and then so in doing so, you you vary the money supply. You transfer seasonality from interest rates to the money supply. Okay, then you've got the Austrian theory of the business cycle. You've got wait a minute, you change the money money supply, and you're going to start driving a wedge between savings and investment. So that's going to have real effects elsewhere. Okay, and that's what happens. You take seasonality out of interest rate, put it in the money supply, but not just in the money supply. You put seasonality or introduce volatility into a whole lot of other areas. And you'd also get that through either changes or maybe be lack thereof of relative prices over savings and investment. Yeah. If you're a farmer, right, I guess here comes your crop, you're going to go out and you're start spending. And then if you're adjusting the money supply to do that, you're going to be affecting relative prices of what these farmers are supposedly spending their money on. That's true, but a lot of it has to do with anticipated and unanticipated changes in, in things, okay? Sort of natural seasonal variation in, let's say, interest rates. Uh, it seems to me that year after year that would have been anticipated, okay? Whereas, and expectations then sort of leads me to believe that anticipated changes have less or no effects as opposed to unanticipated changes. When you start messing with the money supply, uh, that's going to introduce seasonality into a whole lot of other things, and I think that these are unanticipated, okay? I mean, the Austrian theory of the business cycle, if everybody knows exactly what's going on here, that, that uh, the interest rate is being artificially lowered and it's totally anticipated, uh, then that should have no real effect. It's no. totally anticipated. No. Still, you still have a business cycle. Well, have, why then? They would know that that's, that supply shifting out was a nominal increase in the money supply. Well, because, because money is not neutral, and if you're injecting it at one point in the economy, you're going to have changes in relative prices. And it's these changes in relative prices that reorganize the structure of production. Not, it's not a question of whether or not people anticipate it. You know, if you if you have the new money in your hand and you go to buy something, that person's not going to say, oh, I know what kind of money that is. Mm -hmm. I'm going to adjust my prices for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, you know, they're not going to do that. Okay. Okay, well, then the effects would be, I think, greater or more detrimental if, the, uh, if what's being changed is unanticipated. I think the main point, though, even the branch banking may be a red herring uh, in the sense that uh, the, uh, the national banking laws were written such that they couldn't, the banks couldn't issue uh, currency against generalized assets, right? And right. they couldn't, mm -hmm. they had to buy T-bills and, and uh, mm -hmm. government securities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, particular securities that were eligible for this use. So mm -hmm. the, the Supply of currency was very inelastic, mm -hmm. and therefore that's why you get the seasonality in the interest rates because you can't get seasonality in the money supply. In the yeah, the currency supply. In the currency, because people can't switch as they want from right. deposits and currency. And mm -hmm. and Canada didn't have that problem mm -hmm. because they had these banks didn't have these restrictions. They could they could they could issue currency against generalized assets mm -hmm. instead of having to buy securities from the government. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have these, there's no seasonality in Canadian interest rates over this period, none. Um, none detectable whatsoever, but there is in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the, they issued a national, they, and they had 21 major and minor panics, banking panics between 1890 and 1910. And there was some dispute over whether some of these were really minor panics or not. Mm -hmm. But, and they were all either in the spring or in the, in the fall. Okay, during the crop moving season. And so they issue the National Monetary Commission, they get together, they come before Congress in nineteen ten, and they say, Well look, here's your problem. You know, we got we need a Federal Reserve. We need a letter of last resort. When all they had to do was essentially change two laws in the National Bank mm -hmm. and avoid the Great Depression and the twenty twenty one re recession and mm -hmm. that's, been, that's presuming that the the real goal was was to yeah. introduce more stability with that gets back to the yeah. first question, what's intended and what's not. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Federal Fed Reserve Act applied a remedy at the wrong point. Right. Well, which is typical, I guess, yeah. of government 
policy fix. To create a to... problem and then right. create a bigger problem to fix it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that the government wanted a permanent market for its bonds. They wanted, they wanted a, a purchaser to always be the bank you count on. Right. And the, the, the national banks bank. wanted to be cartelized. And the banks. Right. Yeah. And, and this, the, the National the Banking Acts were written during the Civil War, right? I mean, that's yeah. what those windows were instituted to uh, essentially find a market for northern debt. Yeah. So, so I think, back I think Dr. Game. Wells and uh, uh, John are, are still at, at odds on one point, and that's this question over seasonality. Uh, now, it appears to me that you're saying that you'd rather have some form of the money supply adjust to the seasonality of, of the um, you know, agricultural products, while um, as you're reading the Rothbard quotes right at the beginning, you're saying, let's just peg the money supply at a certain fixed amount and that relative price is adjust. Um, regardless of what the solution is, I think there's a fundamental uh, theory question that still hasn't been resolved. Have I, have I characterized? I don't think that's right. What's well, the fundamental theory question that needs to be resolved? Does, is, is this agricultural do you change, seasonality do you allow, do you a problem? Fix money supply or not? I mean, okay. I mean is, is, it, is it something that we should worry about in the first place? Well, John's referring to the increased demand for cash. <coughs> it's a different thing. You don't have to expand the money supply to meet an increased Switch demand for cash. Switch right? yeah. yeah. If you're trying to give me an argument about 100% reserves, I'm not No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm not... Uh, <laughs> no, no. It just, it just <laughs> seems as though that you have uh, a concern over... Uh, the real fluctuations of you know seasonality of you know, agricultural goods and that that has problems cause can cause problems in in the rest of the economy if it's not adjusted for uh, the money supply. Well, no. What I'm what I'm trying to say is these the seasonality and interest rates are the, it's and these banking panics are vagaries of the way the laws were written. Okay, under different situations. You may still get seasonality interest rates, but they might not be as pronounced, and that they 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 uh, you, you might not get these banking panics, okay, that are artificially induced by the fact that banks are scrambling for liquidity, and the only way they can they can issue further currency is by knocking it up at Sam's door and buying U.S. government assets. Uh, under different situations, such as Canada had. You, you don't have that problem. Is there a lender of last resort in Canada for a of No, it's not. Except to the extent that the banks de tended to play off one another. They could, mm -hmm. they could use one another mm -hmm. uh, to uh, draw on their reserves. What do you, I mean, uh, should there be a, a lender of last resort for banks? It's, I mean, I, I was sort of wondering about this. Uh, I don't think there should be for businesses. I don't think for any other. But money is sort of different than you know other things, right? So I don't know if I've made up my mind on this. It seems like you know you shouldn't uh, uh, guarantee uh, or or have guaranteed bailouts for other businesses. Do you? What do you all think about for for banks? It certainly. I mean, it certainly changes banks' incentives. Yeah. So, no, no has it. Yeah. I, I, I still don't understand why, um, and I hope that you can clear this up for me. Um, why is it that simply <laughs> branch banking uh, reduces the risk of you know, problems of seasonality? Is it because that with branch banking you're just a larger bank and have more? dollars or whatever to be able to cope with it, or is it a of question it. of, uh, or is it rather a question of just successfully anticipating these changes and get your house in order? Um, I think it's more the former than the latter. Just because you're big, you can handle big fluctuations. Yeah, you can handle, sh if you have a national bank, you can, you are better equipped to handle even unanticipated, I mean, you will anticipate agricultural Shifts, you know, in the demand for cash. Uh, yeah, after some, you got to catch on sometime, right? But even unexpected uh, 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 shocks in the demand for money, you are better equipped.
to deal with those in these agricultural states if you're nationwide and big. It seems to so be you just a, a more failure, stable... if you failure or drought in some region, then you're better able to take care of it if, you're not, if your banking is not confined to that same region. Right. So, so you're assuming that, that the agricultural fluctuations are not homogeneous in the country. Uh, it has uh, to be heterogeneous. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Well, even, you, I mean, still, you've got a, a bigger bank, more assets you can be able to draw upon. I didn't need any fluctuation. And the more diversified across regions and industries is loan portfolio. Right. The less susceptible it's going to be. And even other shocks, too. I mean, I don't, I can't. Uh, imagine you mentioned like droughts or whatever. That's agricultural in nature, but uh, other shocks, uh, disasters or whatever. And it's still, you know, it's st- you still <coughs> gonna, you've got a upward pressure on interest rates in during Christmas now. I mean, we're not a primarily agricultural society, yeah. but uh, Christmas and and uh, uh, the spring seasons because of Easter and things like that, you know, you've got uh, <coughs> seasonal fluctuations. And the Fed still pumps in money every fourth quarter and takes it out every first quarter. Still, I mean, you look at the, money, you look at the monetary base and uh, the fourth quarter levels of monetary base are significantly above uh, the other three with the, with the first quarter being a trough. And, and even now that would have real effects. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, no, uh, no question about it. I, well, depending upon what model you're in, yeah, you know, I mean, the, the the effects are difficult to draw out, but uh-huh. definitely there's still GMP is very seasonal. Uh, yeah, everything got to be seasonal. I don't know. Oh, it's difficult to say what's driving what. Yeah. Okay. Simply the fourth quarter boom in consumption because of Christmas, the right. gift buying season, would be enough to to push up. Yeah, th- those effects, yeah. those effects, though, are, are probably less in 1997 than they would have been in 1925. It's less detectable. In some way. Uh, people have sort of caught on to what's going on. I mean, one of the, one of the, um, or at least to some degree, I think one of the explanations for why the Great Depression was so great was you had 10 years of people sort of not knowing uh, what was going on yeah. with, um, you know, expansionary monetary policy. Uh, you know, what, one thing that's intriguing about, um, about your talk is that the, the question of price stability just never seems to enter into the rationale for the Fed at all. What? Right? Well, price of money. The interest rates, the price. Price levels. Price levels. Uh, mm. When did that become an institutional goal of the Fed to stabilize prices? Uh, is it? Are you? T- yeah, I don't it's think it is. Goal. Goal. <laughs> or an express goal. Yeah. Well, <laughs> are you talking about uh, like constant? Uh, yeah. Stable inflation. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. There's always I've been a lot of people who've been advocating that. Yeah. The yeah. president of Cleveland's Fed has been rallying for that for since the 80s. Yes, yeah, but, yeah, but it's the goal. But it's the it's the goal. It's the goal of right. It's the goal of stable. There's a core. Of the governors that that are for that policy. Is the goal a stable price level, though, or is it a stable increase in the price level? Well, they always say that if you look at the little thing, stable that inflationary that enough to move M and yeah. together. That's, yeah. that's what they're saying. Yeah. But was there not? There's not. Was there not a wide understanding at that time that uh, there's a connection between the price level and the amount of money in the economy? Uh, well, is there? Uh, I don't know. I mean. Well, the propaganda, they always talked about the Fed um, making possible an elastic money supply, meaning it would contract as well as expand. Yeah, right, right. The idea of you know, constant expansion was entirely foreign, even though that's of course what they wanted. And the purpose of it. this elastic monetary money supply was to stabilize the seasonality of, of the interest, interest rates. rates. That's right. But not, not to somehow put a damper on increase of overall prices. That's right. Yeah, and I don't think they realized the powers they had, at least Freeman and Swartz make this point, but they don't realize the powers, they didn't realize what the tools they had until the Great Depression. Or but even then, happened. they were trying right. all sorts of crazy schemes during the Great Depression, everything but money schemes, right, to, to try to get prices well, the Fed, shaped up. The Fed contracted the money supply by, what, was it a third in the Great Depression, right at the beginning? Well, it was calling in loans. The base didn't fall, though. No, that's because of the main currency circulation. But, uh, and they, yeah, 
Another interesting thing, though, worldwide, you saw a change in interest rates whenever the Fed got into seasonal behavior of interest rates. Even if you look at Bank of England discount rates and Bank of France discount rates and the Reichsbank discount rates, all those were very seasonal before the Fed was introduced and became much less seasonal afterwards, which is somewhat curious. Mm-hmm. So that indicates that they were... Why is that good? Right. Can I finish my question? What? Smooth interest rates? What's the demonstration that actually getting rid of seasonality is a good thing? It's just transferring it. I don't know. I'm not saying it's... I don't think it is. I mean, into many that probably do. Yeah. Did you get that? I don't think we got bogus. Call it a day there. Thanks a lot, John. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it.